letter to the Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 23. Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 23. For visitors here this morning, we're going through the letter to the Hebrews. We're taking fairly long passages in this middle section so that we can see the whole sweep of the passage and then study it in detail at home for ourselves. Verse 23 of chapter 9. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year, with blood that is not his own. Then Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as man is destined to die once, and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. And he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. If it could, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshippers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. First he said, Sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings, you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, although the law required them to be made. Then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this, First he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sins. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, 
but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Remember those earlier days after you had received the light when you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering? Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You sympathized with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not be late. But my righteous one will live by faith, and if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. Always a great help on our Sunday morning studies if you can have your Bible open in front of you. That's so that you can check everything I say and if I say something that isn't in this book or that you can't find there, don't you believe it. Just keep on searching for the truth and let the Holy Spirit of truth teach you. Christianity is better than any other religion, including the best of all others, Judaism. And this is the best religion there was until Christ came. And it was better than all the others because it was true and holy and good. But there are two main reasons why Christianity is better even than the Jewish religion. One is that Christ is so much better than all their religious leaders. Even than angels, as we've seen. But he was better than the prophets, better than the apostles of the Old Testament like Moses and Joshua, better than the priests. So the first reason is that the leader of our religion is better than any other religious leader. They were servants of God. He is the Son of God. And once you've got the Son, that's ten times better than having a servant. But there are other reasons, too. We saw last week that we have better premises and better promises than the Jews ever had. And indeed, this word better is the key word of Paul's, uh, of the letter to the Hebrews here. There's something more we're going to develop. It began last week, but we're going to develop it in more detail. Our religion is better because ours is a heavenly religion. The Jewish religion was an earthly one. And they had to make do with copies of the real thing, with imitations of the real thing. And it's terribly important that we should get right the true relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's all part of the Bible, and Christians read both. But how to relate them is terribly important, and it's a very delicate judgment. On the one hand, there are those who take the Old Testament at its face value and assume that its provisions must be observed by Christians, and we find Christians pleading for Sabbath observance, which is a real contradiction in terms. On the other hand, we get those who just simply dismiss the Old Testament as obsolete, antiquated, out of date, and say, well, my Christianity is based on the New Testament. Both of those two positions are oversimplified. 
God wants us to have his whole word, but to relate the two r rightly together. I don't know if you know the little doggerel line, the old is in the new revealed, the new is in the old concealed. And this points up the very important principle that the Old Testament has not been just dismissed. It has not been abolished in one tiny detail, not one jot or one tittle of the Mosaic law have been abolished, not one tiny fragment. But on the other hand, we don't observe the Mosaic law because its ideas and its principles are now applied in a far better way. It has not been abolished, it has been fulfilled. Now I tried to hint at this last Sunday morning, but let me try and make it clearer again today. We've got here in front of us a lovely model of the tabernacle. Do come and look at it afterwards. It's perfect in every detail, down to the embroidery of the veils. I don't know if we might be able to lift the cover off. Could we? Not now. I mean, after, after the service, and we can all have a good look in and, and see. We couldn't see much now. Um, incidentally, if you were really listening last Sunday morning, you know that I got a number of details wrong from memory, and you can come and check up this morning. I hope you spotted the, not deliberate mistake, but the unconscious mistakes last time. Now, we could be tempted to say, well, that's the building that they needed to worship God. They had to have that. They had to have a holy place, and they had to have a sanctuary. They had to have an altar. They had to have a basin to wash and all the rest of it. And we don't need that anymore, don't we? We need every bit of that tabernacle. But we've got a much better one than that. And it's not the Millmead Center. It's the real thing in heaven. For this was a copy of something upstairs. And we have the real thing. And so it isn't that we've finished with the tabernacle. It, it is that we've got a better one. We don't need an altar in the Millmead Center. And the table that's sitting on is never called an altar because we don't need an altar here. Not because we don't need an altar, but because we've got a heavenly one. All the sacrifices of the Old Testament, we don't have them. We don't bring bulls and goats. Can you imagine some of the congestion we might have if you had to come not only with a car, but with a bull and a goat? But you would have had to do that if you'd come to worship God over 2,000 years ago, the same God you're worshiping this morning. Now, that's not because we don't have sacrifices, but because we've got a better one than all of them. We don't have priests in our church, and I hope you never call me a priest. You don't need a priest on earth to confess your sins, but you do need a priest. You need a priest as much as they did in those days in the tabernacle. But you've got one, a much better one. Can you see what I'm saying? It isn't that all these things are now finished with. It is that they are fulfilled in Christ. We have them in a much better form. And that's why we don't bother with incense and vestments and altars and priests and all the rest. Because we've got them. But they're not on earth. They're in heaven. Every one of these things, if you do them on earth, you're just making a poor imitation of the real thing. And the tragedy is you come to rely on the imitations. You come to rely on the copy. You come to rely on the model. And the model is only, as the Bible puts it, a shadow of the real thing. It may be the same shape, but it's only a shadow. Now, if you want to come and have a chat with me about a problem, you can come and have a chat with me, but you try having a chat with my shadow and see how far you get. I'll gladly stand in between a strong light and a white wall and you can chat away to my shadow and you can maybe get some satisfaction out of it yourself. Maybe you can at least get out everything you wanted to say. But see how much help you get. And if you're going to use shadows all the time and you rely on the shadows, then you will get as much help as you can get from a shadow. The only point of a shadow is that it tells you where the real thing is. And if you see my shadow falling on a wall, ah, you know, there he is. I'll grab him and I'll talk to him. A shadow is only of value if it points to the real thing. And when you've got the real thing, you don't need the shadow, and indeed you forget the shadow. If you saw the shadow of Jesus fall across that curtain over there under the balcony, you just saw the shadow and you thought, well, that's Jesus' shadow. You'd maybe get excited, wouldn't you? But if Jesus came right in here, would you look at his shadow? Would you bother with it? You would pay no attention to it, whatever. You'd look at him. And the letter to the Hebrews is saying, turn away from the shadows. Turn away from all these aids. Turn to Jesus. Look to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. And let him see you right through to the end of the race. That's the message of this book. 
And it's wonderful when you can throw your crutches away and walk and run the race looking unto Jesus. For all these things are crutches for those who can't run. Well, now that's why Christianity is so much better than any other religion. And today we take it a little further. We take it into the realm of sacrifice. We've been looking at priesthood. Last Sunday we looked at the building, and I may refer to it a little this morning, but you've got last Sunday's uh, study in mind, and you can keep looking down here and think that right at that end of the middle building there, the smaller part of that is divided into two-thirds and a third, and the inner third under all those coverings with no window, no candle in inside, but a blazing light in there, the glory of God, right in there is the most holy place. And it's a very poor imitation of heaven itself. Nevertheless, it's of the same character, and we can learn a great deal about our worship from studying that model there. We can learn a great deal about Jesus from studying that model. There are things you can learn by studying the last chapters of the book of Exodus, which is about this, which you cannot learn about Christ from anywhere else in the Bible. And that's when the, the Bible becomes a new book to you. I hope that every one of you buys the little book by Mrs. Hodgkin, Christ in all the scriptures. How many of you have got it? Let's see. Right, the rest of you go and sell your shirt and get it. It's a paperback. You can order it at the bookstore. But she takes every book of the Bible and she shows you Christ in that book. Every single book. Until the Old Testament becomes as Christian a book for you as the New. And you can read about the tabernacle and just see Jesus in a new light. Let's take one example. All the way in from the entrance at that end, past the altar, the bowl, the first curtain, the things inside, the second curtain, and finally that golden chest with the mercy sit on top. All the way in, there's one thing missing from this model. I don't know if you've ever thought of putting on it, but I would want to take a pot of red paint and I'd want to do this all the way through. For then you see it as it was. I told you last Sunday morning, worship was a bloody business in those days. And it still is. The reason why you don't see blood this morning in this building is very simply that Christ has shed his blood once and for all and cleansed not only earth but even heaven itself with his blood. And the entire sanctuary we're using this morning is already sprinkled. You may be interested to know that in our prayer time before the service when the elders were praying, one of the elders prayed that Christ would sprinkle blood on every part of this service. And we believe that he has done so and that we are going through a blood-sprinkled act of worship. There's blood on the hymns we sing. There's blood on the songs we've rendered. There's blood on the prayers we've prayed. There's blood on the sermon. All the way through, there's blood. And if there wasn't, we couldn't get anywhere near God. It's the only cleansing agent that we know of that's able to get rid of stains in the heart. We know of no other cleansing agent that will do it. Water certainly won't. Nothing else but blood can get hearts clean. And this was the message of the tabernacle. Don't come near me, said God, unless you bring blood. Unless you bring the evidence of a life that's been taken, an innocent life. Don't come near me, because I could not accept you until that's happened. And so all the way in from the gate to the most holy place, blood all the way. And you see, we haven't finished with this idea. We've just transformed it. It's not been abolished. It's been fulfilled. And it's by the blood of Jesus. And that's why we sing about it. The reason we modern people have an aversion to blood is precisely this, that we think physical hygiene is more important than spiritual. And we're so wrong. Jesus was criticized for not washing his hands once before a meal. And he said, look, the important thing is the dirt in your heart at this meal table and what comes out of your mouth this meal time, not what goes in. We get so worried about physical hygiene that if we started sprinkling blood about this building, you would feel it was making it dirty. But in fact, in God's sight, you could be making it clean. Big difference between God's outlook and ours. And so blood is one of the ideas that is just the same in the Old and the New Testament. And phrases like washed in the blood of a, the Lamb would be a phrase that a Jew would understand probably even better than a Christian because all the tradition of the, the shadows, the aids, the visual aids, the lessons in bricks and stone and wood and linen were all there in his history. 
Now I must get down to the subject for this morning. I've divided the passage into two halves. First something about Christ and then something about us. The first half is a study of principle, the second a study of practice. The first half a study of belief, the second a study of behavior. And so often the New Testament is like this. It lifts you up in principle and in belief and then it brings you down to earth with a bump and says now practice it in your behavior. And it's, the balance is beautiful because what you believe affects your behavior. If you believed it was going to rain this morning, you'd have brought an umbrella or a raincoat to church. And what you believe affects how you behave. So let's look first at belief. And if it sounds a little theoretical, you just wait till we get to the practical and see what implications it has. Now, <clears throat> there's an outline on the bulletin. You can change the first title. His single sacrifice is the principle we're going to look at. And our sure sanctuary is the practice of that principle. His single sacrifice. We look at his sacrifice first and then our sanctuary. His sacrifice. I don't know if you realize that heaven got dirty with sin. We tend to think it's all on earth and that this planet is the only place where there's sin and any Sunday newspaper will tell you all about it. But this is not the only place where there's sin and we've got to realize that heaven got polluted as well as planet earth and that there is moral pollution in God's own presence in heaven. And the proof of it is that as soon as you get through to heaven, as soon as you get into contact, you'll find evil. As soon as you are in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, you'll find that you're wrestling not against flesh and blood on earth, but against principalities, powers, spiritual hosts of wickedness, where? In the heavenly places. Things went wrong, wrong up there as well as down here. And the blood of Jesus had to cleanse the whole universe, not just little earth. But he had to cleanse the heavenlies as well as the earthlies. And this is what he's done. And when Christ's blood was shed and the blood and water flowed from his side, not only was earth getting cleaned up, but heaven was too. The sanctuary in heaven of which this is a copy needed cleansing with blood. And this is what happened when Jesus died. Just think of that. You can do some things on earth with your blood. You can save a man's life with a blood transfusion you've given. But you can't do anything in heaven with your blood. Only Jesus could do that. And so he cleansed both the earth and the heaven. In other words, to cleanse the heaven, it needed a far better sacrifice than was ever offered here. You see that little square box with two poles there and horns at the four corners? There was a fire underneath and a grate inside it, which you can see afterwards, and the ashes fell through, and the fire was kept burning, and they dragged the carcasses of the animals in, and they put them on there, and there was a cloud of smoke going up from there. But you need something better than animals. Even if they had offered human sacrifice on that altar to get this place clean, that would not really have done the trick. Something even more than human blood was needed. Because human blood is tainted. Human blood is sinful. It's part of a fallen human nature. And so nothing but the blood of Jesus was good enough. Now the emphasis here, when we read this first section of the end of chapter 9, is the contrast between all the sacrifices they put on that altar there and the one single sacrifice that Jesus put on the altar. They had to keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it. And if there's one thing that says, it says that they knew in their hearts that it wasn't working. If you keep going back to the chemist for the same bottle of medicine, if you keep going back to the doctor with the same complaint, you're admitting openly that you're not cured and that you know better. Now you may say, doctor, that does me a lot of good, so I've come back for another bottle. In fact, it has not done you good if it hasn't removed the condition, not in the final analysis. It has not cured you. It may be relieving the symptoms. It may be enabling you to cope with it. But that's as far as it can go. As soon as you are cured, you will not go back to that doctor. I'm afraid we're so ungrateful creatures that if we were cured, we don't think of making a point with the doctor just to go and say thank you. Have you ever thought of doing that? It might just encourage him to feel that some of his patients got better <laughs> and, and that you felt like saying thank you. But if you're going back for the same treatment time after time and time, you, you're doing it because you're not better. 
And if they came day after day, year after year, month after month, to put a sacrifice on that altar, and once a year if the high priest, as he was allowed to do, once a year went into that inner room with blood, not his own because his own was tainted, but the blood of a pure animal, if he kept going in year after year after year, didn't that underline that it wasn't working? You know, there's a, a remarkable phrase in the, let, in the book of Numbers, and it says that the sacrifices of those days were a remembrance of sin. In other words, every time they offered it, it, it reminded them that they still had sin. And Holy Communion could not be more different from those sacrifices because Holy Communion is not a reminder of your sin but a reminder of your salvation. You see the difference? And we repeat it not because we feel that sin hasn't de been dealt with but we just want to praise and thank God that it has been dealt with. It becomes a thank you service and the Greek for thank you is Eucharisto and we call it a Eucharist because it's saying thank you not for a, a reminder of sin but a reminder of our salvation. So we don't call Holy Communion a sacrifice. It's so different. That simply reminded them that sin hadn't been dealt with. Holy Communion reminds us that sin has been dealt with. They had to keep on coming. Jesus did it once and it was finished. And among his last words were, it is finished. No high priest ever said that before or since. Nobody who offered other sacrifices ever made such a statement. It's finished. And therefore, says this passage we've just read, while the high priest used to go on standing, Jesus sat down. You go into a house for an evening meal, and if you see certain people sitting at the table and certain people standing around, you can assume that certain people have finished their work and certain people haven't. The people sitting at the table have finished for the day. The people standing around them have not. They are going on serving. And this very standing and sitting posture underlines the same thing that Jesus, when he'd hung on a cross, sat down afterwards, finished. No more sacrifices. And so the author underlines first the note of his appearance. There are three appearances of Christ he mentions. Number one, his present appearance before the Father. He doesn't keep coming and going to God. He appeared before the Father once to pray for us. That's where he is this morning. He has appeared before the Father where he holds up the nail prints hands never to be pierced again. Secondly, the author refers to his appearance when he appeared on earth. Why did he appear on earth? He appeared on earth that he might be killed for us and shed his blood. Thirdly, the author mentions the appearance of Jesus at the end of the world when he comes for a totally different purpose. These are the three appearances, and each of them is a one-off appearance. None of them are repeated because the purposes are different, and therefore the appearances are different. He appeared once to take away sin he, on earth. He appeared once in heaven to plead for us. He will appear a second time on earth, but for a very different purpose and in a totally different manner. In the same way, you only see people twice on earth. Once you will see them when they lived on earth between their birth and death and the second appearance of men will be at judgment. It's appointed to man to die once and then you'll see your neighbor again once more. It's a sobering thought that you will see everybody you knew once more. They'll appear a second time but for a very different purpose. They appeared on earth to do God's will. They'll appear a second time to be accounted for that as to whether they did it. And so everybody who's appeared once on earth will appear once more in judgment. And in the same way Christ, having appeared once on earth to do God's will, will appear once more not to be judged as he was on his first visit, but to judge. On that day Pontius Pilate will see him again, but the roles will be reversed. Annas and Caiaphas will see him again, but the roles will be reversed. Herod will see him again, the roles reversed. So we appear twice. We do, now and once at the future, at the day of judgment. So does Jesus. And so his appearances are one-off events. He only came to, Christ, to earth once, did Christ, to sacrifice for sins. He will come once for judgment. In between, he has appeared once in heaven, once for all. It's all this once, once, once. Whereas if you had been in that outfit at the tabernacle, you'd have seen the priests. He kept going in, coming out, going in, coming out. They kept appearing, disappearing. It just went on and on and on. 
and was getting nowhere at all. Now the second theme that's mentioned in this first half is his obedience. The whole business of sacrifice was only a pale copy. And the reason is very simple. In the Old Testament, have you ever read it with this in mind, there's a tension between does God want sacrifices and blood or does he want obedience? And the tension grows as you go through the Old Testament. You get, for example, that, that statement in Samuel, to obey is better than sacrifice. Oh, does that mean that obedience can be a substitute for sacrifice? You find it in Isaiah, the same note is sounded. You find it in Hosea, you find it in Amos, you find it in Micah 6.6, 6. you'll find it all through the prophets, this, this tension. What does God want? Psalm 51, it's there. When David, King David, cries out in confession, and he says, I know you don't want offerings and sacrifices, burnt offerings and the blood of bulls and goats and all the rest of it. I know you want the sacrifice of a broken and a contrite heart. Now, which does God want? Does he want sacrifices or obedience? The tension is there, and, and scholars have argued, you can read all their books, some say, well, sacrifice at first, and then obedience replaced it, and some say no, and, and it goes on, the big debate. There's a very simple answer to it. The tension in the Old Testament is there because God wanted both, and he could never get them in the Old Testament. He could never get a sacrifice of blood that represented an obedient life. If you'd seen those poor little lambs being dragged to that altar, you wouldn't have seen any obedience there. No fear. As a lamb to the slaughter. And God was waiting for blood of an obedient life. And the high priest wasn't obedient enough to offer his own blood. Nobody was. And until you get to the New Testament, there's a tension. Which does God want? For God says, look, your sacrifices are an offense to me without obedience. But then at the end of Psalm 51, King David realizes that once God has a broken and a contrite heart and an obedient heart, then, then I'll offer to you the sacrifices. Then. He realized that God wants both. And when Jesus came, he said, Lord, I've come to do your will. And he fulfilled the scripture. You've given me a body so that I can provide my own sacrifice of an obedient, voluntary, rational offering. And for the first time, blood was shed of someone who not only volunteered to shed it, but who lived a perfectly obedient life before he offered it. And therefore, for the first time, sacrifice and obedience blended. And a man prayed with drops of blood on his brow, not my will, but thine be done. Oh, we have a better sacrifice not an unwilling animal dragged as if to an abattoir, but a son who set his face to go to Jerusalem and who refused to let his servants even wield a sword for him, as we shall see tonight, and who went to die. Stainer's crucifixion is captured in a matchless way. The Son of God goes forth to die. Obedience and sacrifice. The third thing is the eminence that Jesus has. We've already mentioned this matter of standing and sitting down, the priest doing it daily, the Lord doing it once and for all. But the emphasis here is that he can sit down because he's achieved at last what sacrifice was meant to do. And what sacrifice was meant to do was to take away sin, not just to get it overlooked. Throughout the Old Testament, it says that God covered sin over, covered sin over. Their sins were covered by the blood of the sacrifices. But you know what Jesus does? He doesn't just cover it, he removes it. Blessed is the Lamb of God that takes away. He doesn't paper it over, he takes it away. You can cover a thing up or you can remove it. Which is best? The sacrifices of the Old Testament only covered things over for the time being, never rooted them out. It's like digging weeds into your garden. You try digging it out digging them in and covering it over with nice clean soil. You see if that deals with it. In fact, it multiplies it. You need to take it away and get rid of it and remove the stuff and then your soil is clean. And, and the sacrifice of Jesus, the eminence of Jesus Christ, is that he didn't come to cover it up. God had been covering things up for too long. In fact, in one text in the New Testament, it says of the Jews that God had winked at their sins. He'd winked at them. He'd overlooked them. 
But that's not enough. I need, I need a sacrifice that will take them away. And once I get a sacrifice that can take them away, I'm finished with sacrifice, do you see? There is no more offering for sin. There's nothing more to be done because the root has been taken away. The thing has been dealt with. There's no need to keep covering it over anymore. It's gone. And that's the eminence of our Lord's sacrifice. It has achieved a forgiveness that all the other sacrifices didn't achieve. They covered things over. From God's sight, Jesus' sacrifice removed, took away, put away. These are the phrases used here. Very strong language. Right, let's come to the second half, our sure sanctuary. Therefore, therefore, verse 19. Therefore, brothers, and everything I'm going to say now is addressed to Christians. If you're not a Christian, I'm afraid I haven't any word for you now. All the rest of chapter 10 is to brothers, Christian brothers. There is an exhortation, there is a severe warning, and there is a practical appeal. And this pattern of exhortation, warning, appeal has already occurred once in Hebrews 6. It's a favorite pattern. Exhortation, serious warning, loving appeal. That's good preaching. That's balanced word of God. To exhort people to do something, give them a severe warning of what happens if they don't do it, and appeal to them strongly because of the reward which comes if they do do it. And so that's the three, those are the three points I want to deal with now. What we are saying is this. There is a human side to all this as well as a divine. Christ has done once for all all that needs to be done. But if we are going to enjoy the results of it, there is a continual thing that we need to do. Now, how often we get it the other way around? How often we say, Jesus should do something continually for me because I once for all trusted him. And we get it the wrong way around. Look, Jesus has done everything once for all. It's we who must have the continual attitude to him. And so we have this exhortation, let us, let us. And the exhortation is in the continuous present tense, which means let us go on doing something. Let's go on doing something. He's once for all done everything that's needed, so let us continually do something. Do you get the picture? Because he's done it once, we must do it all the time if we're to enjoy. Now what must we do? Three things. Faith, hope, love. This is our side. Let us draw near with full assurance of faith. And let's hold fast to our hope and let's provoke one another to love. That's what we've got to do. He has once for all taken away sin. That doesn't mean that we are in practice sinless yet. The Bible is honest. It says, listen to this, by his one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Now, isn't that honest? Do you get the double aspect? He has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. In other words, God already sees the finished product when he looks at your life. He has made you perfect forever. So he's making you holy now. Now, isn't that lovely? The word perfect here means complete, whole. That's what holy means. He has made you complete in Christ. It's all there, once and for all. You've got everything you need in Christ. There's nothing needs to be added to his work. It's all there. So he's making you whole because he's already made you complete. And that's the tension of the Christian life. We know we've got everything in Christ, but we're still trying to appropriate it. It's all there, ours in him, but we have to appropriate it. So let us come with faith. Now, let us say here that a person should come not with doubts or fears before God now. He can come with boldness, without fear. He can come in full assurance. There should be no room for doubt. You know, I would be worried if my children doubted whether I loved them. Your heavenly Father is far more worried if you doubt whether he loves you. Oh, you of little faith. That's how Jesus talked. How much more will he love you, care for you, give you? And so we're to come with full assurance of faith, having our conscience clean, that's vital, having our bodies washed in pure water. If you haven't been baptized, you will be lacking in full assurance. 
because baptism is part of giving you the full assurance. So we approach with our bodies washed in pure water, our conscience free, and Peter in his letter links the two when he speaks of baptism as not being a washing of dirt from the body, but an appeal to God for a clean conscience. So the washing of the body in clean water brings about the clean conscience, which brings full assurance of faith to draw near. And that's the first thing we're to do. Get as near to God as you can. Everything's been done by Christ, so get as near to God as you can. And you can get very near because the way is wide open. You see, in those days, nobody could get near God. He lived inside that inside room, and there was a kind of reception room here. And he, he didn't live in that, and the priest could go into that, but then not into that one. Only the high priest could go in there once a year. And this seemed to say more clearly than anything else, God is so near and yet so far. He's right there in the middle of the camp in his own tent, but you can't go in and meet him. But now let us with full assurance of faith go right in to the holy place, right in to the holy of holies and talk to our Father. Incredible privilege of access. Second, let's hold fast our hope. This is part of it too. Our confidence must have an anchor out of sight. The chain may be visible, but the anchor's out of sight. And unlike most anchors on earth, this one goes up, not down. An anchor within the veil. Now, the veil, well, you look inside this after the service. There's a veil. And it's as if there's an anchor right inside there, and the chain may come right out here, and you can hang on to it, and you can know, I'm holding on. My anchor's right up there, but I'm holding on. I'm chained. I can't drift. The storm may roar without me. My heart may low be laid, but God is round about me, and can I be dismayed? And the third thing, let's stir each other up to love. Literally, let's irritate each other to love. Now, I find this a little difficult to expound. We're good at provoking one another to hatred, not so good at irritating each other to love. The word means to prick each other to love, to goad each other, to nag each other to love. And I want you to notice the most important thing here. Away with the individualism of my personal search for holiness, the Bible says stir one another up to love. You see, if you try to make love a private quest of your own, you'll, it'll defeat its own object because love can't be developed that way. I heard of a monastery where all the monks had spoons three foot long so they could only feed, feed the monk across the table at mealtimes. That was the idea. I don't know if it's apocryphal or not, but stirring one another up to love, nagging each other, goading each other, pricking each other, irritating each other to love, just getting at each other until we learn to love. That's an incredibly strong phrase, but it means that your personal concern should not so much be with your loving, but stirring others up to love. They will stir you up. In other words, your concern should be the holiness of the fellowship. And immediately he goes on to put a very healthy emphasis, therefore don't neglect meetings at church. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. If you're going to help others to be holy, you've got to be there. You've got to be stirring them up. I remember talking to a dear old man. He was stone deaf. He could get nothing out of a service, whatever, but he was always there, way up in Lincolnshire. And I asked him why he came to the services, and he said, well, I feel if I'm there and putting my heart and soul into the singing, I can help others to do so. Now, he got nothing out of the service himself, but he was stirring up others to love. And that's what you came here this morning for, I hope. Not just to have a good time yourself or to get a blessing yourself, but to stir up other people around you to worship and to praise. And to get others going. And that's part of our side. He's done everything he needs to do. Let us draw near with faith. Let us hold fast our hope. And let's irritate one another to love. Mind you, we need to qualify that, don't we? <laughs> you can so irritate people that you think you're giving them the most marvelous opportunity to be patient and loving and kind. But that's not quite what's meant here. <laughs> Stirring one another up. So in this second half, first confidence. You see, the veil has been ripped. It was a gorgeously embroidered curtain, but it was ripped from the top to the bottom, which means God ripped it. God's hands. If I can put it this way, when Jesus died, God was uncovered. God was exposed when Jesus died. The veil was ripped, and it was ripped at the very moment that his body was ripped. And, and that veil was, in a sense, a symbol of his flesh. Because God was in Christ, but the veil was there, and people could look at him and say, is not this the carpenter's son? And they didn't see. 
But when he died, you know, the veil was ripped and people saw God. And if you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus on the cross. Not just his life, but go to Calvary and look and see the veil ripped away and look at God. He's exposed now. You can see now what God is like and God is holiness and love. The veil is gone. It's been ripped away, rendering obsolete the temple and the tabernacle. But exposing God and saying, come right in. Let's draw near. The second note in our sure sanctuary is perseverance. Now here there's something pretty serious said from verses 26 to 31. It's all of a piece with Hebrews 6 and it says simply this. It's to Christians, remember, that if you have come to a knowledge of the single sacrifice to take away sin and you go on in the state of mind that simply wants it covered up but not taken away, then frankly you put yourself in a very dangerous position. If you treat the sacrifice of Christ in the same way as if it were the same as the sacrifice in the tabernacle, then you are in frightful and fearful danger if you just want things covered up but not removed. What are you doing? There are three strong words used here. Listen. You are spurning the Son of God. You're profaning the Heavenly Father. And you are outraging the Spirit of grace. Those are very strong verbs. I was in an ironmonger shop this week in Guildford and there was quite a hot discussion going on about Dave Allen, television comedian who had last week, or week before last, done a skit in which he dressed up as the Pope and did a strip tease on the Vatican steps and tried to justify it again this week in his show, I gather. Now, that is the kind of verb that is used here kind of language that would be used about that, the kind of language that was being used in the discussion in the shop. And I was quite amazed to see how many ordinary people were horrified at what they felt was an insulting outrage. But that was only of a human being. And the Lord knows if people insult us as much as they can, they still don't know the worst about us. But when you do it to the Son of God, when you outrage the Spirit of grace, which you do, if you don't want sins taken away, in other words, as, as the writer says, if you go on willfully sinning after you've found out about this one sacrifice, what are you doing? You're putting yourself beyond reach because this one sacrifice is the only one there is. It's once for all and there's nothing else. And therefore, if you don't let this one work in your life, there's nothing else that will work. And there's nothing for you to look forward to but a fearful judgment and a raging fire. And then comes this severe word which is in the New Testament, not the Old, and which is written for believers, not unbelievers. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. How do you fall into them? Very simply, those fall into the hands of the living God who haven't come into them. You either come into them with full assurance of faith and say, Thou blessed rock of ages, I'm hiding in thee or else you're hiding from him and from others, in which case there will one day be nowhere to hide. That's the severe warning given here. The need for perseverance, the need for letting the sacrifice that Christ made once for all really work and do its job. He sat down in heaven expecting the sacrifice to work, just waiting until all his enemies are under his feet, says this passage. He knows it's got to work. He knows it's going to work. And it will. And one day every enemy of Christ will be under the soles of his feet, his footstool. But whether an individual lets it work fully or not is a different question. And the writer here warns us that if we've got a better sacrifice, then it must do a better job with us than the old ones did with the Jews. And finally, he pleads with them for endurance. Endurance. He describes that they've been having a tough time already. He says you've been subject to abuse, you've become a gazing stock. That hints of the Roman arena, I think. He says you've suffered affliction, or literally you've had to fight he says you've been imprisoned and if you didn't go to prison yourself, at least you went to visit Christians who were in prison, you identified with them. Does that challenge us to identify a little more with people like Georgi Finns, our brethren who are in prison? 
Should we be willing to identify more with them? He said, you not only went to prison yourselves, but you were willing to be identified with them and to go and visit them and to be linked with them publicly. You lost your possessions. You know the previous church of which I was pastor. In their church records, I found out that there were days when the Baptists in that village had their property confiscated by the public authorities, their furniture, their goods and chattels, and they had to watch all their private possessions being sold on the village green in Chalfons and Peter. And the proceeds were not given back to them. And then they were hauled off to Aylesbury Jail. But they went singing hymns. Why? Because they had better possessions. Far better possessions. There is someone in the congregation this morning who was burgled some time ago. And I'll never forget your first remark. The thieves couldn't touch our most treasured possessions. You can stand the loss of everything if you've got something better, can't you? something better that can't be touched, where moth and rust do not consume and thieves do not break through and steal. And so he says, you've already known persecution. You lost your property gladly. Don't give up now, please. This is the appeal he makes. He said, there's a reward waiting for you and it's only a little while longer. Fancy just not enduring and losing the reward at this late stage. Now, the writer of this letter was clearly a man who knew a lot about sailing. I've already told you that and pointed up to certain things. What he's saying now is this, and he's using nautical terms. He's saying, look, you've been through the worst of the storm. Don't reef your sails now when the voyage is nearly over. It's a tremendous appeal, and he uses the Greek term for reefing your sails, of bringing them down a bit. Shrinking back, it's usually translated here, but it's a naval term for lowering sail. He says, I beg you, the voyage is nearly over. Just a little while more. Look, the just shall live by faith. And, and the rescuer is on his way. He'll come and he won't be late. The date is already fixed and the time is known to God when Jesus is coming back to complete it all. Oh, just hang on till the end of the voyage. Hold on to the anchor. Don't drift. Don't shrink back your sails. Complete the voyage. Jesus, Savior, pilot me over life's tempestuous sea. Safe into the haven guide, oh, receive my soul at last. Complete the voyage. Don't shrink back. Don't lower your sails. Don't lose heart, but endure. Go right on to the end. We are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, who lower their sails and stop sailing, but of those who go on believing and are saved. So we have a sacrifice that's so much better than anything that went on in the tabernacle or the temple. We have Jesus, who once for all offered himself to take away sins, not to cover them over, but to take them away. And now it's up to us to draw near with faith and full assurance, to hold fast our hope until the end of the voyage and to provoke each other to learn to love each other and not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the custom of some is but to go on and on and all the more because the day is getting so near let us pray We're going to sing very quietly together a little chorus. Oh, the blood of Jesus, it cleanses white as snow. Oh, the word of Jesus, it washes white as snow. Oh, the love of Jesus, it makes the body whole.
Jesus, we make that our prayer and ask you to plant your word deep within us as a fellowship. For your name's sake. Amen.